Hey everyone, so I think we're both a little bit nervous about this, uh, but we're going to go there. We're going to go into conspiracy theories. Even just saying that word, I know that some people react to it because they'll say that's just a way of dismissing alternative narratives. Uh, so we're not going to do that. We're going to really talk about it in the context of the crisis that we're going through right now. The thing that we're really interested in is why the levels of certainty on all sides. It was really interesting. We put out a film yesterday or a couple of days ago with Daniel Schmachtenberger about conspiracies. And I saw one of the first comments was, which side is Daniel on? And then five minutes later, oh, I'll keep watching. He's on. It's like, this is really interesting. But we can't make sense of things if we've got kind of an attachment to one side or the other. So what we're going to do in this film is talk to some of the people that we've had on the channel before and some new people. Um, so John Viveki, who's a cognitive scientist and professor of psychology at Toronto, who looks at like how the brain works, why we fixate on certain things and ignore other things, like how our pattern recognition works. We're losing a lot of our connections. We're losing a lot of our identity around work. Our home, what we consider our home and where we're safe is shrinking. And then at the same time, we're, we're beginning we're from our, 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 like even our scientific and political authorities, we're being told about this thing, which is like an Old Testament deity. It's ubiquitous. It's invisible. You don't know where and when it's going to strike. You don't know who to trust anymore. And look what it's demanding from us. It's demanding very strict, strict purity codes. It's like we're suddenly back in, you know, the early Iron Age. And that is that, you know, and, and, and this is deeply baked into us, this way of thinking purity codes and demonic forces. And also to Carl Miller, who is a researcher at Demos in the UK, has been looking at uh, information warfare and conspiracy theory since about 2010. So you tweeted out something like, hey, my friend is basically a sane individual, never been into conspiracy theories before, but now won't shut up about, you name it, 5G, COVID, Miracle Cure, George Soros. So is your sense that this, this stuff is growing right now? Yeah, I mean, as a researcher, you always want to you always want to say things which you only have robust empirical evidence for, and we're still doing the research on it. But um, yeah, I, I think I think the 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 evidence is now mounting that this is the single most um, pregnant moment for conspiracy theories probably in history. And also, we'll play some clips from Daniel Schmachtenberger, who we've had on the channel before. A lot of people have a strong bias towards wanting certainty. Recognizing how big of an infinity the unknowable is, everyone has to make very deep friends with uncertainty to not be mentally ill. That doesn't mean that they have to do the move that all there is is uncertainty, nothing can possibly be known, which is also gibberish because the fact that I can't know anything with perfect certainty it doesn't mean that I can't know things with much higher relative certainty. I think the more we've been talking about this over the last few days, um, uh, with a lot, quite a lot of energy because it's ramping up so much, uh, the more it's felt like something, something that guests like Ian McGilchrist have said in the channel and that we, we've said a lot as well, which is that very often it's not the what, it's the how. And so what feels important right now to me uh, in this information ecology, which is just mad, crazy, there's narrative, there's narrative warfare, there's narratives flying around everywhere, there's information, there's misinformation, it's, it's sometimes impossible to tell. I think the question we should be asking is, how do we arrive at truth? Not what truth should we be arriving at? I think part of what's important is for individuals to start having, you know, for us all to ha start having our own discernment because the old gatekeepers of our information are no longer reliable, it means we have personal responsibility. What I don't see a lot of right now on any side of, let's say, what Peter Lindbergh has called the liminal war that's happening, the big information warfare, is a, an admission of uncertainty. It almost seems like this desperate, anxious urge to get away from uncertainty at any cost. So it's either there are no conspiracies, you're all mad, or there are conspiracies and this is what they definitely are. Um, so that in-between space isn't, I think, a wishy-washy space. It's, uh, it's the most realistic space to try and navigate, but much, much harder. There's another really good framing piece, I think, from one of the people we've featured on the channel quite a lot, Jordan Hall, 
where he talks about that in the process while we're moving from like broadcast to decentralized media, we're moving from effectively a sort of TV world where there's a kind of eternal, there's a very short memory. The, the main feature of the internet and the, of the digital media landscape, we're in a world of kind of eternal memory. And in a world of eternal memory, it's a completely different dynamic where it's possible to piece things together. How many people used to know about actual conspiracies that definitely happened? Uh, Operation Paperclip, uh, Mockingbird, like what was on, on COINTELPRO, MKUltra, like things that actually happened. Uh, before the internet, the number of people that knew about those was probably pretty small. It's almost like a cliche now, the sort of like the great revealing or the great unveiling. Like there is clearly some truth in that. There are pe things that people have been doing that are going to be uncovered. Um, and that there are now paper trails, like it's much more difficult to uh, hide your tracks completely in so many different areas. So there are things that happened and that we're in a completely different landscape. But then you've got this also idea of like overactive pattern recognition or reading too much in, which also happens, which John Vivekey will talk about really well. It jives with a lot of very good uh, cognitive science. So Whitson, uh, Jennifer Whitson has done great experimental work showing the following. And think about how this, this just links up with everything I'm saying. If you put people in situations where they feel that they're losing control. Now, she did very careful work to show it's not just that there's a threat. People, if people have a threat and they feel that they can respond, what, what I'm going to talk about doesn't happen. But if people feel that they're losing control and you induce this in them, you know, very experimentally, then what will happen is they will they will be much more prone to seeing illusory patterns. So if you give them noisy data, they'll see faces in the data and they'll find patterns. And and now directly, she directly tested that when people are in those situations, they are much more prone to believing conspiracy theories as well. So what people are doing is it looks like right loss of control, and then what the brain does is ah find a pattern. Find a pattern, find a pattern, find a pattern, make meaning. Because if you make meaning, especially a meaning that in which you play some role, right? Like you have an important role, you're the pure, and there's the impure, right? Then uh, that uh, will presumably uh, afford the brain at least a pretense of being able to interact and start to regain control over its environment. Now that's really, really interesting because that also lines up with a lot of work about uh, you know hyper uh, that we can we that we have an evolutionary predisposition to what's called hyperactive agency detection. So the idea is that when in in our evolutionary background, de detecting agents was really important uh, because you're trying to avoid being you know something something something's food. You're trying to find food. You're trying to see, find human beings because they might be dangerous. They might be helpful. And so we're wired to overlook, we overcompensate, and we misidentify faces and presences and spirits everywhere. And so once again, if you're starting to look for meaning, right, and this hyperactive agency detector is cook, kicking in, people are going to start positing hidden agencies behind things. And that, of course, is the kind of thinking uh, that loads you up for conspiracy theories. And, and, and this also jives with another thing, like when we're... So the left and the right hemispheres, remember that uh, wonderful conversation I had with Ian McGilchrist, right? And the left hemisphere is very, you know, certainty and step-by-step -step and pre pre precision. And, and Ian has a lot of legitimate criticisms about being that too oriented. But if you remember, he did acknowledge there's a dark side to the right hemisphere. And here's where it is. That right hemisphere probably originally evolved for predation. So it has wide open, you know, attention it tolerates ambiguity it's looking for threat and it's gestalting it's grabbing at whatever patterns it can so when we feel like we're being preyed upon the right hemisphere gets very active and it starts looking for hidden patterns you see how all of these different adaptive features are all kicking in and then we have a cultural milieu and a, an actual biological situation that is triggering a lot of this you know like i say mythopoetic thinking and ancient kind of biblical grammar and so I've been really concerned that, you know, this is a, a way in which the meaning crisis 
right? Because of the way it's left people, by and large, very secularized, very autodidactic and fragmented in their spirituality and then in then their religious education and in their wisdom training, that you know, that this stuff is going to be triggered, it's going to come up, and they're not going to be able to monitor and manage it. And so conspiracy theories are going to be highly, highly prevalent. The brain prefers prediction over anything else, right? Explanation. So what happens is people get very focused on, ah, this is this insight explains it all and makes sense and give me, gives me a, how I can deal with this and how I can tr- translate my anxiety into fear and who's the hated object and who's the villain. And what they do is that becomes super salient, and then they forget to counterbalance that with yes, but did my was my theory generated by a lot of good independent lines of evidence? And this is the hallmark of irrationality. We get over fixated on how much we like the product of our cognition, and we don't pay any attention to the processing by which that emerged. And David, that is especially dangerous with mythopoetic thought because we don't know where that thinking emerges. And it comes out of the unconscious, and we don't track it, and it presents itself as numinous to us. It's especially dangerous of this kind of plausibility bullshitting that we are are liable to. I think something that's worth bearing in mind right now in the situation we're in, in this crisis, is that we're not in a normal state as a culture, let's say. We're in some kind of strange altered state, and that has a huge psychological impact. And... So I have a, a background in the psychedelic world, and that is really, a, and, all, and also other practices, and many, many of those practices are about uh, experiencing an altered state. And there's a specific way to navigate an altered state as well. And what uh, Stanislav Grof describes psychedelics as is non-specific amplifiers, which means that whatever's there already, when you have a, have a psychedelic experience, it's there and amplified massively, right? So. That what we're going through, and this is a point Catherine McLean has made really well, is that what all the things that were in our culture and in us as individuals are suddenly amplified. And that means that we're suddenly faced with, with a situation where we have to deal with a lot that's coming up. Catherine McLean made the point really well that it's like, this is actually a time for us to look at all that stuff as it's coming up. It's sort of a time for facing our demons and our deepest hopes and fears. In fact, Zach Stein, who we had on recently, made a very similar point. We're in a kind of space between worlds. And what that means is that all of our imagined, all of our like imaginal, as you could say, all of our imaginal potential, the things that we can imagine is heightened, really, really heightened. That plays in a lot to, to the kind of ideas and the kind of possibilities that we can entertain. And that's, a, that's something that happens during crises very often. Um, and maybe it's even adaptive because we need new solutions. So there's a natural urge to consider things we've never considered before. So that really fits with something that Jules Evans, the philosopher and author, wrote, where he looked at kind of the communities that he's part of, like the sort of spiritual alternative communities and seen kind of how a lot of sense making had been breaking down and came up with this really good, I thought a really good analogy between the two different ways of looking at the world. And there is some research that um, people who are prone to conspiracy theories score high in, in a personality trait called schizotypy, which is basically you're, you're, you're prone to unusual beliefs. Um, and um, people who are drawn to spirituality also score highly in, in schizotypy. So, so those are some of the kind of possible personality trait overlaps. But I also thought um, that, that in a way, spirituality and conspiracy theories come um, from a similar kind of historical culture. And that culture is um, like the occult, the late 19th century, early 20th century um, occult, which grew up and appeared at a similar kind of time to now, a time of uh, breakdown in certainties, breakdown in, in, in traditional authorities, and a time when a lot of people were dying because of the First World War. Uh, And it was a time, a liminal time, when all kinds of new ideas arose, including ideas around like the occult. And what you see in the occult is, I guess you could think of it as two different traditions or two different experiences. One is a kind of positive conspiracy, which you could um, define by a kind of sort of mystical experience, like everything is connected I am connected to to everything in the universe, and that's wonderful. 
The universe's mission is flowing through me. I am naturally attracting helpers to, to kind of bring this new age, this glorious new age for humanity into existence. Um, so you see lots of people in the occult in this kind of ecstatic globalism, I, I call it. People like um, H.G. Wells or like theosophists or, um, you know, in, in the... In the New Age movement in the 70s and 80s, there was a book by Marilyn Ferguson called The Aquarian Conspiracy. H.G. Uh, Wells wrote a book called The Open Conspiracy. And these were like ecstatic, networked, globalist, progressive, free love um, people. And they're like, this is happening. An age of love is happening. It's happening through us. We are the, we are the kind of vanguard. We are the elite. Okay, so that's one, what I call the positive conspiracy. And then there's the negative conspiracy, which kind of grew up in reaction to that. And the negative, it's kind of like the bad trip version of that good trip. And it's like everything is connected. Um, there's an elite controlling everything, but I'm not included. Uh, I'm an outsider to it. So instead, everything is connected and controlled by some shadowy elite uh, of self-appointed kind of masters uh, and, 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 and they're all kind of networked together in their own like think tanks and organizations and they're controlling everything and they must be stopped. Um, and it's interesting that what you see in conspiracy theorists like Alex Jones say is um, they're really gunning for this kind of globalist elite. Um, and for example, um, Alex Jones in 2010 came out with conspiracy theory that Bill Gates was only putting money into vaccines to try and lower the world population, that it was a eugenics plan. What's funny is that, you know, looking at the, the other kind of tradition of ecstatic globalists, a lot of them were into eugenics, like, you know, H.G. Wells, Teilhard de Chardin, Julian Huxley, they were uh, eugenicists. So I guess what I think is that these, these two traditions, the positive, ecstatic, euphoric, globalist conspiracy and the negative paranoid anti-globalist uh, conspiracy they they're kind of two sides of the same coin um they're they're they're, they're two aspects of, of a similar trip they're both prone to magical thinking they both see everything as connected um they both they're both ego distortions in a way in one of in the ecstatic trip your ego is connected to everything and you are super powered. In the paranoid trip, uh, you are connected to everything, but you are at the mercy of these, of these kind of superpowers. And it's interesting you talk about kind of the good trip and the bad trip. And in the David Icke interview on London Real, he actually had both of those sections. He had the kind of the, the beginning, like the, the, the globalist, the secret elite that are ruling the world, this evil cult. And then at the end, very much sort of new age. My level of consciousness is bigger than theirs is. We all need to kind of realize that we are God, that we are pure consciousness. Those two things existing together at the same time in the space of like two hours. Yeah, I think they come from a similar state of consciousness, which is um, liminal, uh, a kind of archetypal, magical, mystical. Uh, if you, if you want to be, you know, psychiatric speak, schizotypal, but I don't necessarily mean that's a bad thing. But you can see that someone can switch in, 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 you know, on psychedelics within the same trip, even within the same hour, from the kind of ecstatic, euphoric, I am the universe, I am, I am a super being, to kind of curled up in the corner in the fetal position, uh, they are coming to get me, they being whoever, the FBI, the Illuminati. So, um, and, and, and there is that fluidity in these kinds of liminal states. I think um, it's interesting to think of it as, as a trip. Um, what, you know, and it's a trip in the sense of the normal boundaries of the ego are distorted. Either you're completely expanded, connected to everything, or you're like, you know, uh, sh uh, shrunk and feeling under attack from invisible forces. So what are the tools can help, that can help us in a, in a trip? Uh, or in a spiritual emergency. Uh, there are things like, um, you know, reality checking, which of course is hard when you're tripping. Um, I think humility, 
um, being, you know, like humble, including epistemological humility, like being humble about your truth claims, about what, you know, what, what, you, what you know, and also being humble about, you know, you're probably not a master of the universe. Jules mentions actually in his piece, this film that's come out recently, that's had, I think, at the time of recording this, for like almost 9 million views on YouTube called Out of Shadows, um, which is looking at primarily how, in their view, Hollywood is controlled by the CIA and um, kind of there's a big focus that they have on kind of satanic and occult influences. And I think it's what Jules is talking about really explains very well you know, he talks about like the good, the, like the good trip of I'm one with everything and, and everything is interconnected to the bad trip of everything's interconnected. Only I can see it. And it's all evil or or much of it is evil. There's this huge focus in that film around um, evil and actually evil in the philosophical kind of sense, like the problem of evil, of like deep satanic kind of evil. There's a lot of archetypal uh, concerns that they have. And there's also... To, to draw on, you know, what John Verveke talks about, this kind of hyperactive salience network. So they're talking about various symbols being satanic. I mean, this stuff is not new. This has been around the internet for, for quite a while. But I think it's really worth picking out, you know, not the what. Um, are there those conspiracies going on? Are there unexplained things? Yes, surely there are some unexplained things. And so I don't, it's not so much about the what, it's about the how. What are the psychological processes and the tropes and the similarities that we see when, when we talk about the idea that there are symbols hidden everywhere and a kind of heightened psychotic state or a heightened hypersalient state? Um, and there are a lot of similarities, and those are, I think, really worth bearing in mind. I also spoke to Carl Miller, who hasn't been on the channel before, but had a really good conversation with him. He works at the, a place called Chasm, which is the Center for the Analysis of Social Media. So really looking at kind of online sub-communities, uh, the narratives that are going on there, where they come from, and actually started by looking at sort of, and spent a long time in different sort of conspiracy communities since about uh, 2010. We're trying to understand the kind of the sheer spread of it, try and understand the different kind of communities involved, the different messages which are contained in it, of course, trying to understand the effect it's having on people. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess like driven by a concern that at least some conspiracy theorizing can have kind of direct harms to people in 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 in, in different ways. Um, of course, like there's a concern that um, when you don't think that coronavirus is a virus, but you think it's caused by 5G, uh, which is kind of one of the kind of major claims which we're seeing emerge and, and evolve at the moment, well then public health advice looks very different rather than it being a kind of series of necessary kind of clinical steps which are needed to keep people safe, you've suddenly got a smoke screen being spread by the kind of medico-politico apparatus in order to kind of cover the rollout of a dangerous technology. Um, we're seeing a lot of kind of miracle cures being sold on, uh, on conspiracy theory groups as well. Um, so there's, there's specific harms we think that are attached to conspiracy theory communities that we're trying to try and understand and then work out ways of responding to. But yeah, I mean, just in general, like the kind of scale of this is absolutely crazy. Um, we're seeing kind of millions upon millions upon millions of shares across Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and Twitter. That's not even taking into account the alt tech space where a lot of these things are brewing in the first place. There are flourishing infrastructures of subreddits, which are kind of impinging on the kind of main coronavirus reddits. Um, it's a kind of dizzying, bewildering moment where conspiracy theories have kind of gone into overdrive. Um, and not just in scale. I think the other kind of really kind of powerful effect which we're seeing happen in front of our eyes is this kind of almost this kind of emergence of like a kind of Franklin conspiracy theory, a kind of metastasizing of, of different... Um, and I think it's actually just an acceleration of what's happening before the pandemic, but, but different kind of groups of conspiracy theories kind of beginning to kind of congeal and join together into this kind of grand, um, broad, like profound kind of series of allegations about how the world really works. Um, not surprising, of, all, of course, because, I mean, the whole point of conspiracy theories, the reason they exist and the reason they're created is because of the joining of dots. So all you need to do is join more dots. Um, link more hidden motives, identify more hidden groups, and then suddenly kind of bridges can quite easily be built between conspiracy theories, which initially started very far apart from each other. Mm. 
Yeah, and what's your sense? Because I'm very, I'm concerned about that the narrative usually from kind of mainstream organs is how could anyone possibly believe in this and very dismissive, which I think, I mean, I, I find that quite concerning because I think a lot of people are suspicious of that. Um, so how, how, like my sense is that actually the, the weak point in this is the level of conviction that people tend to bring to it, that actually the place to, to address it from is a place of more uncertainty, like grounded uncertainty, because a lot of it seems to have this kind of religious fervor. And then I do think there are some holes in a lot of mainstream narratives at, at times. So by saying, no, you've just got to trust the mainstream, isn't there a danger there? Yeah, so there's there's a lot of problems with simply reacting to this as as um, as um, the product of a series of crackpots. Firstly, like the sheer scale of this, these are not just a few crackpots. These are millions of our fellow Britons um, across the country. Um, the idea that um, people um, have to be kind of crazy or nuts to believe in conspiracy theories is, is the second problem. You know, this is kind of pathologizing it and trying to turn it into a mental illness, which kind of obviously sits kind of four square against a general kind of like urging that we all have on each other, which is to kind of be sceptical, independently minded citizens and that we always need that within a democratic society. And also that there is a, in a world that's so unequal that we're talking about kind of the 1% and the point of 1%, in some ways, uh, metaphorically, it seems true that your life is beyond your control. It's being organized by people who have an enormous amount of power. So to actually kind of turn that into a narrative about the world is not that far off how it feels to, to be in, in a hugely unequal society in a way. No, and I, I think actually the, the best kind of explanation that I have ever come across for conspiracy theorizing is that it is a, a, um, a ideological response to structural inequality. Mm. Um, and I think that um, very clearly when you look at where conspiracy theories bloom, they bloom in inequality, inequalities of information and of power. Um, societies which are more unequal um, tend to be much uh, less resilient to conspiracy theories than ones which are, are more equal. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but I, I think in many ways then, like what conspiracy theory actually is, is like the personification of um, a more generalized sense that um, there are agencies and, and, and powers in one's life which one cannot control, um, which is a very human response, but of course, in, some, in many cases, a flawed one too. There's a few things that are becoming kind of viscerally clear to people right now, one of which is that there, there does seem to be a similarity between the, the spread of the virus and the spread of kind of viral misinformation. Like that, that sort of it definitely feels similar. And also this sense that we're all publishers. Like suddenly I think people are realizing we, we all have, and somehow in some sense, I think we all need to learn some discernment. We all need to learn, do I share this? Do I check this out? Like we're, we're all publishers now. Like every, everyone is, is a vector of potential transmission of misinformation to someone else. Right. I mean, it's, it's no um, accident that we've long used epidemiological metaphors in trying to understand the internet. Yeah, virality being the, the best one, but, but definitely the idea that both information and behavior are infectious, you know, and they spread across networks and we are vectors. These are all, these are all ideas which kind of academic studies have long used to understand how the internet really works. Um, and as, as publishers, you know, I mean, and this is something that I guess we, we called for in Demos in 2012, but, but could never really managed to quite get on the national curriculum. Um, we do have kind of digital citizenship requirements. We have responsibilities to one another, um, which, um, again, probably now more than ever, um, are easier to forget that we've got um, and are easier to ignore. Um, you know, uh, it's exactly moments like this when we're kind of acting really fast. You know, we are um, acting quite impulsively online. Um, we're probably spending more time online than we've had in, we, we've had in the past. We're probably living in environments online which are quite unfamiliar to us um, these are exactly the moments when we can find ourselves kind of spreading information to each other um, which um, actually if we were to pause and consider for a moment um, we'd probably regard as being harmful um, but very interestingly you know um, much as lots of people have been kind of contacting me to talk about a relative or a friend that's suddenly taken this kind of conspiratorial leap um, they, they, they've come they, they kind of like as, as I talk to them about it there's another thing which 
is very interesting, which becomes clear, which is that when they're challenged on the information, there's, there's a common response, which is, um, I, I, I don't know if it's true or not. I just thought it was um, worth sharing. You know, the idea that um, there's more harm in not sharing a possible piece of true information than there is in sharing a possible um, piece of bad information. Um, and that's a very, very common response, which lots of people have, lots of people have sent to me, um, which I think like, a, like is, is probably a massive misconception with how information works and what information can do. Um, information is not simply liberating. It can also itself control and harm people. Um, and probably the biggest flip, there's one kind of suggestion I would have, and it's to me as well as to everyone else, because I'm by no means a perfect representative of this, but we need to kind of view information diet as being a kind of diet. Um, it has health consequences to us. Um, it changes who we are. Um, where we spend our attention changes who we think we are, the identities we have, the relationships that we have. And we need to use it much, much more self-consciously and de deliberately as we go about our increasingly online lives. This is one of the things that I find with regard to conspiracy is I find that people have an aesthetic bias where anything they hear as a conspiracy they either just kind of reject it all up front. Oh, fucking tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists. They just automat auto reject it without studying it, even though history shows how much people have conspired, just meaning some people share info with each other to advance shared agendas without sharing it with the public and sharing some disinfo. You can go back to Sun Tzu and read about disinfo and how to do disinfo, right? Like we've been doing that for thousands of years, pretty intelligently and coordinatedly. Um, and so it's interesting how easy it is for people to reject something as, oh, that's dumb conspiracy thinking when you actually study history. Then on the other hand, there are people who, if they hear any conspiracy, they assume it's probably true. And if they hear that anything came from a authoritative institution, they assume it's probably corrupt. And that's also completely silly because if the groups were that corrupt, they would be overturned. So I see that same weird certainty on both the conspiracy theorists and the anti-conspiracy theorists. Like there is this in-group thing where one is it would be so bad for my in-group if I was part of the critical thinking anti-conspiracy camp and I started saying, you know, maybe there really is such and such, that there's pretty strong incentives other than just clear thinking against it. So yeah, a real focus for both Carl and John was that it's a mistake almost to like take on the beliefs themselves. It's not really about that. It's about how we come to those beliefs in the first place. I mean, what I see from a lot of the mainstream um, organs, like the media is like, how can these people possibly believe this? This is just ridiculous. And that just seems very uncompassionate. That's not how you would react to someone in your family who was, who was deluded. So how do, we, how do we engage with people? It's not only uncompassionate. I'm going to be harsher, David. It's stupid. Because it's, it's to maintain the very wrong framing. It's to point at the product and say, bad product, bad product, bad product, oh, bad product, and, and not acknowledge the power of this adaptive machinery. There's a reason why people are making use of this, because it's, it's maladaptive. It's this powerful adaptive machinery. And just yelling at them, first of all, gets them even more strongly focused on the product and diverts them from possibly paying attention to the process. So it just exacerbates things. And then secondly, it's itself, it's disingenuous because it's not paying attention to the reality of the power of this adaptive machinery. And it's engaging with what's called the fundamental attribution error. Instead of paying attention to the process and the context, you're just saying, oh, what a stupid person, right? And that is not the appropriate thing to do. So in fact, I would suggest not challenging people directly on their conspiracy. I would say, can you get them involved with other practices that trigger that same adaptive rewarding machinery, but in a healthy manner that orient them like the Stoics did towards the meaning making process? This is why I'm offering the meditation, right? I'm not going to go out and challenge, you know, you know, oh, 5G is causing, you know, the coronavirus because you can't when people are locked into that parasitic processing. It takes a lot a very complex interaction, but instead... If I can say, well, you know, you're under stress. And I, I, this sounds like I'm conning them, but it's, it's, I, I'm trying to be responsible. It's like, you're under stress. Come over here and learn to meditate. 
and learn to contemplate and maybe learn to get into the flow state with doing some Tai Chi. And notice how these things orient you towards your processing and then take it deeper. And then people start to get other kinds of insights that compete with the conspiracy insights and they're insights of meaning making rather than maladaptive meaning projection. I think that's what you have to do. But I think so just... Kind of, it's, so it's kind of a meta move of how do I come to these conclusions in the first place, actually paying attention to what's going on and how what the process is of coming to these yeah. conclusions. But don't directly point people there, right? Because if you just say, turn around and look at your processing, they're going to, right? <laughs> That's not going to work. So what you have to do is get them attract. You have to, this is what I talk about this. This is the aesthetics. You have to beautify for them. You have to make beautiful for them, paying attention to the process, reflecting on how they're coming to their uh, uh, um, insights and, and finding insights of meaning making as opposed to just insights of control, valuable and beautiful and tasty to the mind. That's what I'm talking about. So is your sense that, that things are going to get worse before they get better? Oh, well, like, uh, like uh, I was saying, I think that, um, you know, on the heels of the COVID crisis, there's a meaning mental health crisis of tsunami proportion portions coming because you know because what's happening to people is you know their relationships are being uh destroyed uh their identities are are, are being challenged uh you know their their patterns and routines the ways they sort of kept themselves busy um are, are being disrupted and 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 they are they're getting a very clear sense that things aren't going to go back the old normal right so the, their worldview the sort of the obviousness of common sense has been significantly challenged so yeah i think I think that we're going to face like the, the meaning crisis, the mental health crisis on meth, um, uh, and that's coming. And it's already—I've already noticed it. So I, I have no scientific data; I can't collect it right now, right? But anecdotally, you know, in the network, people are starting to report this this sort of looming sense of not quite having the, a, a, a confident grip on you know, reality things, people are saying this a lot, everything feels surreal, right? I'm, I'm hearing that a lot. This feels surreal. And that's not said like pleasantly, like a dot, like some sort of dolly painting. It's like, ooh, you know, nightmarish surreal. And, 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 and they're talking about that they're also, you know, a, a kind of nebulous dread. Um, and those are very foreboding forewarnings that, you know, people's mental health is going to be challenged in very powerful ways. Yeah, and you, I think you're right that we're going to see more and more of this kind of thinking because it, it feels a lot like the when you read about accounts of plague times in London and that was a real trigger for religious mania, for various different kinds of conspiracy theories of all kinds of, of all different totally, kinds. Totally, totally. And, and look what seems, happened. Oh, sorry, David, go ahead. I was just saying, yeah, that just that's in the post, I think. Yeah, I mean, and look what happened. Look, at, I mean, I do. I go. I go into detail on this in my series, right? About what happens to the entire worldview after the Black Plague, right? And how it shatters the medieval synthesis, and it just like everything gets changed, and it just launches the culture in a whole, totally different direction. We, are, I, I think. Now, I don't know if COVID's at the same level as the Black Plague. I'm not. I'm not claiming that, and, and but I think it's reasonable to believe the following, that this is not the only pandemic we're going to be facing. And the idea that if we can just get through this and then things will, will, will go back together, uh, you know, the way they used to be for centuries and centuries, I think that's really irrational. All of the factors that are the plausible explanation for why this pandemic occurred are all in place still and are all accelerating. And so, the idea that this is going to be a one-time affair, I'm very, I, I, I find that a very doubtful proposition. Yeah, let's let's finish on a high note. <laughs> but but remember what I said: in the midst of starvation and plague and literal military siege, you have Socrates and Plato and the birth of an entire new way of understanding reality that took the axial revolution throughout the world. So there is, right, Kairos always has both of the potentialities 
available to us. And it is a sensitive period. It's a period unlike most of our lives where our actions have the capacity, our individual actions have the capacity to make a significant difference. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.